So hi everyone, my name is Emily. As mentioned, I'm one of the graduate fellows of for mentoring this year. I'm also a third year in, uh, in my PhD for industrial engineering. And so today um, we wanted to talk about how regardless of Purdue being a leading university for diversity efforts, mentoring, managing, and diversifying graduate student groups when it comes to diversity is still a crucial problem to address. And so nonetheless, today we have a panel um, to tell us a little bit more about how can we um, help drive these efforts on campus. And so with that, I'll let each of our panelists briefly introduce themselves first of all. Sure. I'll start. I'm Tamara Tenzer Ursum. You can call me Tammy. I am an associate professor in biomedical engineering. Mm -hmm. I've been at Purdue for about 10 years now. Um, I also wear a hat as the associate head of academic programs in the department. So when uh, I think today I'll be speaking both from a, a, a research mentor perspective and kind of a departmental leadership and what each of those kind of structures can do to increase diversity in our graduate population. <clears throat> So I'm Steve Bowden. I'm a professor in chemical engineering. I've been here since 2003. Nice. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm also the director of the Purdue Energetics Research Center. So this is a interdisciplinary center, primarily engineering, but also College of Science, probably 28, 30 faculty and about 150 graduate students. Energetic materials are um, high energy density materials, explosives and propellants, pyrotechnics. So that's my research area. I had served as the university senate chair. I was in the provost's office for a while. I've been in a bunch of different leadership positions, but right now I'm just a regular old professor trying to keep a bunch of faculty moving in the same direction. So delighted to be here with you. Hello everyone, my name is Sokuru. I'm Sokuru Zenwa. I'm a PhD and PhD candidate in chemical engineering. And before this, I was an undergrad at South University back in Boston. And uh, I also have the you know, privilege of serving as the graduate chair for the Purdue National Society of Black Engineers. I've also been involved in you know, other organizations on campus, including the Nigerian Science Association, and also like the um, Talbot and Pai, um, you know, fellow engineering on our society. And uh, I think today I'll be glad, I'm, you know, I'm excited to share some of my perspectives as you know, someone who, you know, has, you know, who identifies like a, man, as a member of like a minority group. And I also have been in like groups where I've really seen sort of like diversity play like a strong effort in ensuring that you know, everyone seems like everyone feels heard and everyone like really enjoys their time there. So I look forward to the rest of the session and sharing some of my thoughts and also hearing some of the questions. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. LeVon Esters, uh, professor and um, associate dean for diversity and inclusion faculty affairs at the Purdue Polytechnic Institute. So I've been in Purdue now 13 years, um, and I'm also the director of the mentoring, so we may have been mentoring a Purdue program or the MAP program. It's been around for about 11 years now, and um, we started that program with the sole purpose of trying to um, enhance the mentoring relationships between faculty and staff. Um, the byproduct of that also was using it as a mechanism to recruit um, the bunch of grad students and let them into the College of Ag. That's my teaching home. Uh, uh, academic home, excuse me, it's College of Ag. And so uh, we've been at this about 11 years and we had developed a strong brand identity. Um, Steven is actually uh, my doctoral student. He's been a member of the, was a member of the MAP program. And so we can speak to that maybe today. Um, there's an opportunity to uh, add some more context. But, uh, you know, I think I'll end by saying that you know, I believe military grad students like I love and I've enjoyed it. And um, and we've had a we've had a really great run in our lab over the years, and students like Stephen and others. And so for me, um, whether it be directing math or just in the work that I do in terms of advising and mentoring students, it's just a way to give back and help uh, develop future leaders. So I'm um, looking forward to being here and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. So to emphasize the importance of our topic today, um, the first question is, what are the benefits of having a diverse group of students? Why should our audience care about what we're discussing today? Whoever wants to answer first. Yeah, I'll go. So, well, besides just being kind of, you know, we can start with it's just the right thing to do to make our research groups mirror the society around us. Um, you know, beyond that, 
there's um, lots of academic research and peer reviewed material talking about and from from academics, but also from consulting companies, McKinsey, you'll see reports on how diverse groups of, um, well, just diverse groups produce better products. Um, they, there's a new idea coming, and so you can go see the research around that. There's new ideas coming out about, um, especially in engineering, people-driven engineering, which focuses on not just producing products for uh, diverse populations, yeah. so better medical products, better mm -hmm automotive products, whatever, but also driven by and recognizing that people are also the ones that are producing that products and, and we need to mentor them and cultivate those, those human resources from the very beginning of, um, of you know, establishing a human engineering and engineering design. So those, I think it, it, there's this seed and a, and a, a vine and a continuum through mm -hmm. all of those. Are you passing me? I'm okay. passing my passing. You're right. going down the line. I, I, I agree completely with what you said. From from my perspective, the world is small and closely tied together. And uh, what we do is not done in a vacuum. And so if, if we want to have impact, if we want to change the world, if we want to be successful, we have to be able to engineer products, develop ideas, and work with people who are different from the people that we bump into when we walk down the street right, in our neighborhood that, that might be much more homogeneous. So when we have this diversity of thought, this diversity of background, this diversity of upbringing, all of these kinds of diverse aspects of what we're doing, we inherently make products, ideas, approaches that are going to be more appealing, more successful, more effective, more impactful. And that's what we should be doing. That's what we should be doing. Uh, engineering around folks who look like me um, mm -hmm. is a very limited proposition. And so I like to have a diverse lab. I've been very pleased with the diversity in my lab over time um, because I think that we do a better job because we're not uniform. Yeah, for me, I can speak on the, the, the social and the cultural aspects of, you know, why I think it's important to have a diverse group. Now, one thing I've observed, especially you know, being as a Latvian in a group that I think is very, very, very well diverse, is that you see that you learn a lot about you know intercultural, cross-cultural communication, and you learn a lot of skills that even go beyond just being in the group. Um, you you learn how to communicate with people from different nationalities, you know, different identities, and you know, you, you get to see how to, you know, how different people from different cultures mm -hmm. receive feedback, right? The way that you maybe receive feedback your whole life might not be the same way that like other people might receive feedback and you might not really notice this thing. So you have to, you, you start learning in the group how you know, to communicate, criticize, you know, give all those things to different people in the group. Then there's also the social aspects, you know, I'll say in my own group, I really enjoy the fact that you know, everyone is from everywhere and and whenever we have our social gatherings, it could be maybe organized by the professor or by ourselves. It's always nice to hear about, you know, you know different things that people do outside of the lab. It's nice to hear, see kind of different foods, like all those different things. And I'll say like all those things really help a lot um, in the experience of being in the lab. I think we're starting to move towards, especially like for graduate students, we're starting to move towards like a world where you know, like mental health is becoming like a very big thing. So I think it's important. It's you know students are starting to understand the importance of trying to build sort of like family-like groups instead of just okay maybe like business or we're just working together just to get something done. And I think that's where you know diverse group really comes into play. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I agree with everything, and I think uh, Stephen, can you show that picture? I, I emailed Stephen the other day because I want him to showcase a picture. Um, and I think drives home um, what was not only just said or shared, but my perspective on this. So this is a picture uh, that was taken of me in my grad lab uh, a couple of years ago when I won Mentor of the Year for the College of Ag, but also National Mentor Award. And I was in the office one day, so I had this picture just hanging in my wall in my office, and one day one of my students, Victoria, who's the second one left with the Purdue, Black producer, and she said, Dr. That's, that's a powerful picture. 
And um, I said, you know, talk, what do you mean? She says, you know, all that it represents. And uh, I've used this picture in a couple of talks I've given recently uh, about this topic. Uh, but it's very recent and powerful. The reason why this picture, to me, in my opinion, is powerful for several reasons. One, it represents what the ideals that were just shared, how they should look in reality, right? That's number one. Number two, this picture represents diversity in its finals, gender, race, ethnicity, some other identities, right? It represents inclusive excellence. It represents diverse career pathways because you have students here. Some Quincy in the far right who just started her job as a sixth professor at Oregon State University to uh, Brooke, who's second from Stanley, Stephen, who works for the Stand Next to Stephen, who works for the Indiana Europe program. Um, it represents access and opportunity, which we had a land grant. And that's the essence of being in a land grant institution. So for me, again, all that has been shared. This is how it should look. And if you do what we're going to, if each of us engages in these practices we're going to discuss today, I would argue. This is what your lab should look like. And anything short of this, then something's not right. So I just thought I'd share this picture because of what it represents. And I think it's a good uh, reflection, a representation of again what uh, our primary panelists uh, shared this far. Thanks. Thank you. So I love this idea of how we mentioned diversity in thought, background, culture. Diversity doesn't just mean in who we are as a person. So how can we, whether it be a student, faculty member, staff member, anyone on campus, improve our intercultural understanding? So let me start. I think uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is uh, engaging in professional development. I was talking to someone the other day and um, they started, so we were having a conversation about something related to this. And, uh, they made it a point not to say trains, because they did not like the word trains. They wanted to refer to it as professional development, which I, I agree with. I think we should refer to it as development, uh, if you will, and especially the professors, because we're all professionals, whether you're a student or otherwise. So I think that one way to do it is to engage in professional development is <laughs> high quality, right? And um, you know, also engage with colleagues who, like those on this panel and others, and those audience who have been engaged in this space in this work and who made strides in the space. So I think to the degree we can do that, I think you'll see that um, we can move the needle individually, but even as a collective in terms of our intercultural understanding. Yeah, I'm going to tell a story. That, so this is not as formal as what LaVon just mentioned, but not that I, and I completely agree with what you just said. When I was an undergraduate, I uh, had a friend who was in one of the black fraternities, and they had a ceremony for when he was fully admitted to the fraternity from being someone who was a probationary member to being fully admitted. So he invited me. So I went to this event, and it was me and several hundred black people at this party. And it was an experience to realize this is what it feels like for these people all day, every day. Um, and everybody was kind to me, everybody was welcoming to me, but I was acutely aware that I was not sort of somebody who fit into that group. So when you talk about professional development, I think we, one of the things that resonated with me was this idea of part of that would be realizing what it's like to not be yourself, right? To, to be what, from the background that your student is from or from the background that your colleague is from, right? Which might be entirely different from in my case than the George, at a, especially at a university sort of position. So that just stuck with me forever. Um, not everybody is gonna have the opportunity to walk into an event like that, but whether it's a formal sort of experience or uh, a fortunate experience, um, that the realization that everybody's reality, even in the same place is quite different is a very important reality to finally get. And if you don't get the, if you don't walk into it by accident, like I did, um, to have opportunities available to you to, to make that realization and then to take advantage of them becomes important. Because until you've done that, you don't know what it's like to be sitting as a, as a person who's not part of your group um, in a room, in a setting, in a research meeting, at a conference or any place else. 
that understanding, I think, is very important. And once you have it, it's so much easier to relate to people who are in that position you were in that you never thought of before. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, no, yeah, but both of you really brought up very like uh, nice examples and nice points of uh, like intercultural communication, uh, intercultural uh, understanding. And I'm gonna bring like that perspective of. I think that uh, you know, as you know, those of us in academia, we're typically like you, know, you have a lot on your plate that you don't really want to like sit down and maybe watch a TV show or like kind of listen to podcasts and other stuff or on intercultural uh, you know com communication. However, you know, we can start thinking about you know, how do we find some of these spaces, right? Sometimes you can stumble into them by accident. Sometimes you can actually actively seek out the spaces. I know Purdue has a lot of you know organizations that are trying to cater towards different minority groups. And these organizations usually throw a lot of events throughout the year. As one of these events are pretty much open to different people. So if you're a faculty, I'd say like sometimes you can just maybe find out like, oh, if you're invited to one of these events, instead of just you know, clicking on the email and thinking about it, hey, the National Center of Black Engineers is doing some event. Let me just go check them out. Then we we'll, like see what they're doing, right? Same with like Shipi and a whole lot of other groups, right? I think that that's one way I, I think that we can really you know try to start communicating with people. Another thing which I also think you know can help is um, you know, this is something I say I've been there from like my past five years at Purdue. The fact that just by walking around, you know, I know that pretty much everyone you see around here is associated with Purdue in some way. Just starting like some casual conversation, even if it's just like waiting at like uh, this like this stop sign here, this walk sign. I've had very nice short <laughs> five, you know, five second conversations with people just by waiting at that stop sign. By talking to different mm -hmm. people, you start realizing that, oh, you see this person every time. You've been seeing them every time, but now you're actually seeing them more. And then every time you discuss with them, you get to learn more about them. And in this way, you really like get to like mm -hmm. meet people from different cultures and everything. They start understanding what are the things they care about, what are the ways they think about stuff. Mm -hmm. And those are just like the two perspectives I want to bring in, like trying to find out. So where are some of these events happening? Can you just maybe like going, discussing the put here, or just like randomly talking to different people and getting like different perspectives? So we've heard, I love, I agree and, and want to kind of amplify everything that was said and, and think about it kind of structurally, right? So we have the individual and, and how the individual just can be so open-minded and put themselves into a space that, that they're not comfortable. Um, and then if we think about our, you know, moving up from the individual into our own research groups, um, we all have group meetings. We can bring some of these social um, um, identity conversations into our group meetings through professional development, you know, talking about social justice, talking about diversity, and then moving it up and supporting efforts in the department um, or college level. Silmar uh, is the center for intercultural learning and research um, here at Purdue and they put on a, a bunch of different events you know as as professors and educators we can bring a lot of those learnings into our classrooms like there's so many different ways and opportunities for us to grow personally and professionally and then also like help our students and our mentees um, so I just wanted to kind of basically highlight and, and amplify some of the things that at every level that can be done and incorporated so, and it just just little steps at a time. Wait, the idea that uh, we're all still making progress <clears throat> is that I think an important idea. We can always be better at, um, at this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we sprinkled a little bit about the next question in there. So question is, how can we better demonstrate sensitivity to culturally diverse populations on campus to improve student retention? So we sort of talked about how we improve individually, but on campus, how do we improve these efforts to retain our students since a lot of our efforts initially are at the front of recruitment, but once they're here, how do we retain them? So, um... Three things that come to mind um, when Steve is saying this, these questions, and this is one of the questions. I think the three things that uh, we could do, uh, we should engage in. One is uh, engaging in an equity mindset, right? 
meeting the needs of everyone, but adjusting as necessary, uh, creating and ensuring a sense of belonging. Um, you all agree with that. And then the third thing I would say is the ethic of care. So I think that trifecta, if you will, uh, to use the sports analogy I made, I think, uh, I mean, there are many other things you can do, of course, but I think for me, the degree in which you can allow these things to permeate the culture <clears throat> of an institution, college, department, college, university, if you will, um, then I think to your to your point that these issues of retention can be better addressed. I, I do think that um, in many ways, we don't do a good job in each of these three areas that I just mentioned. So I'll stop there and put on this. I really like the ethic of care that you just mentioned. I think about what we do um, for a lot of our retention programs. People get a lot of attention right up front, right? And um, a lot of welcoming, a lot of networking, care and community building. And then it's the third week of the semester, or it's the fourth or fifth week of the semester. And everybody goes back into their shell and does what they do, right? And we all cope with it, right? We all we all came in this morning and went and grabbed our coffee because we were too busy coping. We didn't have time to get our coffee or our orange juice or whatever it was, right? Because we're too busy coping and dealing with, right? And so that idea of that ethic of care, um, I think that for, I feel like for, for our students, um, when they know that you care about them, especially that you care about them, person you care about their success personally and their well-being person because you take a little time to talk with them you take a little time to inquire how they're doing you take a little time to sit down and, and encourage them that that caring aspect is i think critically important for people who uh, are trying to find their way i was a terrible undergraduate she was at my home institution and you should probably look it up uh, <laughs> donna can right um and i was always yearning for people who would just say something positive and encouraging. Um, and I think that's universal. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all still trying to get to what this thing we call success, which is different for all of us. And to the extent that we can demonstrate in ways that are meaningful to that person that we're trying to help, who we're trying to help, we can demonstrate that we do care and, uh, and connect with that person. I think it can make a big difference in how we retain people across the board. So it's, yeah, it starts with the individual, and I think we've talked a lot about that, but I want to also elevate, like, structurally within departments, having that ethic of care um, as a value, and then starting to, to think about how we can can amplify that in, in the individual and, and, and model that for others, um, and then value it as part of our job. Um, is something that I think we all can look at the center of and do better. Um, I, I've seen um, a, a slight shift um, over the last couple of years, which I which I welcome. And you know, when there is uh, an event going on in the world, or there's you know something that's impacting our students, um, there's always a notice that comes out and says, you know, let your students know that they can go to push. <laughs> you know, like. What about, you know, let your students know that you're there for them. <laughs> you're there to listen. Take time out in class to address it. Take time in your group meeting to address it. Show them that you care. And there's also these other services. And there has been a little bit of a shift in that messaging. Um, and so that's a welcome shift. But I, I challenge everyone to think about, as opposed to, you know, a morning student is having a problem, let's send them to MEP. No, <laughs> that is not, you know, that is, that is not this taking on that personal responsibility to show that you care, to empathize, to meet the, the students where they are. Um, that's where it starts. That's what needs to be more valued and very helpful. So one, one thing I wanted to add was, uh, you know, one of my own personal experiences, I'd say I've really enjoyed the fact that whenever I walk into my professor's office today today, or even when he sees me in the hallway, the first person he asked me, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And I like, I don't know if he, I don't know if it's something that is intentional for him, but I always you know, find it much easier to really tell him, hey, it's been like a rough week, or it's, you know, all those different things. And he would actually like place into you talk through like, you know, 
the question. Some people sometimes just ask you how are you doing, and they don't, they don't care about the rest much, right? <laughs> <I know. laughs> so, so yeah. So I think yeah, it, it's, it's something we 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 want to understand. I think for me, from that perspective of being like the driver's step, right? Um, I know like there's been you know in, I've, I've heard a lot about how oh grad students should be working like ETL or work weeks and all those things, but I think that I've started to see like kind of this shift away from just working those lot of hours to sort of being able to maybe like optimize the time you actually do work and then spend all that time just like you know doing things that really promote your well-being, you know, like you know, pretty much you know, things that are pretty good in this panel about like here. So that, that, that's just like a separate personal experience from my own side. Um, so that's one of those contributes to this first thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I like Goro how you mentioned that um little details in our conversations and acts of how we relate with others can sometimes improve how we feel welcome on campus. So the next question is, how should mentors or mentees initiate conversations with one another if they have different backgrounds? We need, I, I think it's important that we focus on getting to know each other as people personally, individual, personal discussions. Tell me about, I, in my class, I used to put students in groups and I would make them, I could, their homework wouldn't be graded unless the group handed in a response to a question. Mm -hmm. And the questions were always these intercultural questions. Of, uh, describe the best meal you ever had and why was it special? And so <laughs> students from, I got students from all over the world answering this question and they'd all have to have one answer. So everyone would have to hear about everybody else's best meal ever and why it was special or what was the, the most important family holiday or what were the roles like in your family growing up or who had the most difficult trip to get here from wherever they were from. Right? And you can't have those discussions without really understanding the person you're talking to. And the whole point of that was to get people to know each other, not just as that person over there who's that color or who's that gender, but that person over there who has this amazing story that came with them, who went through this amazing thing to be here. So if you can have a personal relationship with someone instead of a relationship that's sort of based on mm -hmm. my impression from TV or what you might be like, I think that's the start for actually having real understanding and real community. So I, I think, and it's true for faculty, we just happen to have all the power, right? And even graduate students and your undergraduates, you have more authority. Um, it still doesn't mean that we know each other. And so that knowing personally about people and understanding them as individuals, I think really helps to make all of the other discussions more straightforward and easy. And the questions about what was the most amazing meal were so awesome to read. <laughs> <laughs> Just to learn about what the students' lives were like before they came here. It's really impressive. I'm taking notes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So I guess it's a question of like how how can each of one of us make make a difference and be more open to those individual conversations. I don't know that I've answered that. Um, yeah. I, I'll pretty much just echo what I said. Right. Um, genuinely, I'm someone that I've gotten to mentor other younger graduate students. I've also you know, I mentor mentors. In the last five years, I've met not about you know, six different undergrads from different backgrounds. And I know, you know, those questions of <clears throat> how are you doing? What's happening? I always ask, you know, people meet on a Monday, I always ask, what did you do this weekend? Right. So those questions like that, I think they, they help to start breaking the ice on you know, sort of you know, that you know, communicating across different backgrounds. And slowly you start really getting to build up, oh, how can you really communicate with this person? I know there's sometimes a common misconception that if you, you know, develop like a personal relationship with someone by asking them some of those questions about their life, then it might really hamper like sort of some of these professional relationships. But one thing I really know, you know it's, that's like some some people believe it's that way, especially when you're in like you know, some of these like hierarchical structures where you have student faculty and everything. I know in my group, for example, you know, my professor you know, from day one, he's like, don't call me Professor this, call me Rash. And if I call him Professor this, he's actually gonna like scold me. So I think that helps break the ice. 
And for the like length of time I've been there, I've never like seen any like, you know, dish, like any like, you know, disrespect from anyone else. I think we always understand who is the boss in the room, but you don't have to say who is the boss in the room. <laughs> You're still like, so we go to conferences and sometimes people can't even tell who is the professor, right? And that's something like nice to always see people sort of trying to guess which of them is professor because of the way we relate to your communicate. So I, I think, you know, uh, from my own perspective as a graduate student, it's that environment that was you know, laid out by you know, my mentor and people might have different opinions on that. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is, um, you know, just, and this was uh, mentioned, uh, different ways, just, you know, get to know your your mentees or advisees, right? Just sit down and get to know them, spend time. Um, it was mentioned, you know, one of the things I do before we, when I meet with Stephen and my other advisees um, every other week and more times than not, majority of the time, almost all the time, first thing I ask is, how are you doing, right? It's easy for a professor, if I can remember, to just start out, where's X sign, where's Y sign, right? <laughs> but sometimes you do that, you kind of, you can rally a student, they can get nervous. Well, that, I'm glad you don't stop here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't. Talk football, we tell me everything. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 we do. I think it's important, you know, like Steven's going to Iceland, and say, hey man, I saw your picture on Facebook, how to tell you about the trip, how's it going? But I do that with all those students on that picture. I do that, and um, it's it's um, it's benefited the group. It's benefited myself. It's helped us build uh, tight relationships, and um, and uh, and so yeah. So that's what I do. I just I just want to know about who it is I'm engaging with, and I think the degree in which you can do that, um, some of these issues that that we uh, discussed today, um, you know, can be navigate it better because you have a personal connection with the student. I have one more perspective just to share on, on this topic uh, before we go on. Emily. Um, as, a, as a graduate student and even a graduate mentor advisor, it, it was shocking to me at first to realize just how diverse any university is going to be in that regard. You, know, you think about anywhere that we might have come from, maybe we went to an undergrad institution where Everybody that we were in classes with looked similar to us. We came from similar backgrounds from us. You know, I came, I've come from rural Tennessee, and the the place that I went to undergrad, um, it was it was pretty evenly mixed, uh, white versus black. But we didn't really have a lot of international students or anything like that. And a lot of the people that I graduated with came from similar towns in Tennessee that I did. When you have international students coming here, maybe their home country was that same type of way. They grew up the same type of people. They came. Uh, you know, to their undergrad institution. Once we get here, I mean, we are all in a situation in graduate school where we feel like we're the only person that really comes from our same type of background. You know, I, I didn't know anybody from the state of Tennessee when I came here uh, to Purdue. I didn't really know anybody from other countries. And the, the students that I've talked to that are international students coming here, like, it just, it can be emotionally draining when you feel kind of like Steve was saying, that you're the only one in this group um, and that you're the one that sticks out. But realizing in graduate scenarios with that diversity that we get of students being from all across the U.S., all across the world, all different growing up backgrounds, all different parent life, uh, sibling life, whatever. Once we can put that aside and, you know, as some of y'all are saying, just see each other as human beings. Then we we've broken the ice. Now we can see, hey, what food do you like back home? Man, that sounds good. Can we figure out some place to, to go get something similar here or something like that? Some of the coolest conversations that I've had from being a student and into being in this position working with students is just learning more about where people come from and what life is like for them and seeing what's similar, what's way different. And, you know, especially those things that are way different. I mean, that's that's always cool. But I think the thing that we have to remember that we don't always do is that everybody's kind of nervous in that those first interactions. And we kind of have to swallow our pride and just be like, hey, I, we might be going through similar scenarios without ever knowing it. Um, and just having to have the courage to get out of our comfort zones. I mean, by nature, I'm actually more of a introverted person who just likes to carry on my own business and you know, keep my head down in the elevator type. But you almost have to step out of that comfort zone and have those conversations. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to go about your entire career without ever gaining more perspectives. And, you know, 
the, the students from other countries that I've gotten to hang out with and build relationships with. Those have been the coolest things because I finally put into my brain without ever even thinking about it. They're far away from home and they're going to be here for a while without getting to see mom and daddy. Like I am far away from home and can't go see my siblings and parents and everything, but I can drive six hours to go see them. They're, they're going to be six plus years without seeing them sometimes. And realizing that I might be the only brother that they have here. And if I can be a family member to them, so to speak, over the next few years, that means a lot more than just having a professional relationship and understanding their cultural differences. Building those deep relationships sometimes just simple and easy. Swallow your pride and be like, hey, we got stuff in common. We don't know what it is yet, though. We're not going to know before we talk. <laughs> Can I add just one more thing? I did think of something, and but and it's kind of just highlighting and and the what's already been said and you know and agreeing with it. Um, but I also want to point out how as you know because this is for a senior uh, graduate student postdoc faculty audience, how this these behaviors, how we model these behaviors um, in setting the tone in you know interactions with our graduate students or our undergraduate students and how that is then trickling down. So, you know, the behavior that, that is, you know, open and welcoming and talking about um, caring about what the what our students do, that gets modeled down when they then interact with their undergraduates, when they're a TA and how this, how, you know, how we model these, these caring behaviors um, um, just really kind of spread out throughout the whole university and, and then become, as your question, um, kind of hinted at how can we all feel more comfortable and break down those barriers. Thank you. And thank you, Stephen, for your um, sharing thoughts. How do we, uh, we really, really want to act on these things, but how do we actually uh, impact things at the mentorship level when it is all these one-on-one -on -one relationships and we can't force the faculty to behave a particular way uh, although we'd really, really like to. Yeah. Any thoughts there from all of you, guys? Yeah. Yes, please. I have thoughts, but go ahead. Okay. So I think we all do what we get reinforced for. Right. Right. Were you going to say the same? Yeah. We all do what we get reinforced for. So if you see, um, you know, Levon was talking about the way that he responds to his students and, and acts upon, right? And um, listens, inquires, gets everybody to contribute, right? And does exactly what you would expect and hope that your mentor would do, whoever you might be. So when we can reinforce that, recognize that, um, and then everybody else wants to be reinforced and recognized and rewarded, then you can start to, to drive people to all want to be, you know, just like Levon just demonstrated and should be. Um, and I think that to the extent that we can find tangible ways to recognize people for what they do well and show others that that reward is waiting for you, then we can drive people to do that. But without, and I hate, it sounds so uh, transactional, but at the end of the day, we do what we're paid to do. Uh, we do what we're rewarded to do. And so if you can reward people for doing what I would hope we would do anyway, you can drive people to do. It. And maybe that's recognition, um, maybe that's other tangible kinds of rewards, but to the extent we can quantify it, identify it, reward it, praise it, others will want to line up around it. Yeah. No, that's the, here's exactly what I was going to say. So if you say that you value something at the college level, at the university level, in your group level, how do you show, how do you quantify it, measure it, and then reward it? Um, you know, how do you make it a metric upon which success at the university level um, or at the college level. So um, okay. we have very few, you know, we like to say we have very few sticks and carrots with which to influence faculty behavior, but they don't not exist. Mm -hmm. Like we can put our assessment and and rewards behind what we value in a better way. And it's tricky. It's tricky. Because if you get Congratulations, Steve. We want to nominate you for X. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna develop a four-page statement of vision and I'm gonna this and a that. I'm gonna get six letters of recommendation and they're all less than one page, five pages of student comments, and 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 it's like, oh please don't nominate me. 
um, just somebody recognize what it's doing. <laughs> and have that for, right? So it's, I understand, again, the point I'm making, Donna, to speak directly to you, it's tough, okay? but I, I agree, important mm -hmm. um, to, to find a way to recognize and reward people for, for behaving the way we wish that everyone would behave. Um, part of the faculty survey that's mentioned about this, this year, one of our questions um, was specifically asking faculty, what sort of recognition would you be interested in if we were to, um, you know, recognize good mentorship? And, you know, is it a personal financial incentive? Is it money for your lab earmark for your students only? Is it just general money for your lab? Do you just want your picture on the front page? Um, what are you interested in? And it was interesting because we got a really wide variety of responses. People who were saying like anything at all would be great. Um, people who really wanted money for the lab. Other people who were like incredibly passionate about the fact that you should not be rewarding them because this is their job and they should do it anyways. Um, <laughs> so it was interesting to see, but um, just say you haven't heard through all those results yet, but check it out in our number and report. All right. <laughs> 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 I might add something if it's helpful to this dialogue. And uh, this is coming from the corporate world. Mm -hmm. In addition to everything that's been said here, um, it's been said that the greatest motivator for change is pain with the status quo. And so as long as people are comfortable, you know, they have a hard time changing. And you're talking about changing the culture, which is the hardest thing to change, you know, those day-to-day -day behaviors, beliefs, and things. But there's also a saying we had, you know, when you're trying to push change through an organization, and we could push. Y'all don't have that same, you know, ability, you know, in a university setting. But, you know, if there was a key leader that wasn't on board, your choice is to educate, replace, or prepare to fail. And that's kind of the reality. I don't know if everyone knows it. That comes from the most profitable company in the history of civilization. <laughs> that, is not, that is not an exaggeration. That is a fact. Um, and so the, the evidence speaks for itself that that does work. Mm -hmm. So feeding back a little on the idea of not just vocalizing efforts, but actually doing them. So as leaders of lab settings, the next question is, in what ways can we as group members, whether it be the leader of the lab or a member of the lab, become more inclusive in our own in lab environment? Maybe a follow-up question is, what practical methods can we pursue to make everyone in the lab feel equal and involved? I think we, we mentioned a few of them already, right? Just that, that care um, and asking people how they're doing, connecting with each other on a personal basis. Um, and as a mentor of a group, though, it's it's important to make sure that, you know, that everyone feels comfortable in that space and everyone is being heard in that space. And everybody comes into it with different um different personality, you have introverts and extroverts in a room and you have different, you know, people that are have different comfort levels being in that space, but but making sure that you that you are communicating that this is important, right? That everybody's input is important. And we want to hear from all of you. And there are different strategies, you know, very different, very simple strategies to make sure that happens. Letting people know, you know, don't call out people without letting them know you're going to call on them so they have some time but you're calling on them, you're including them in those discussions. Um, so there's, and there's you know, plenty of, of books to read or you know, things that we can do to, to train ourselves to, to be able to feel comfortable doing that within your group. Um, not everybody, you know, as PIs, we're not trained in this type of people management skills at all um, <laughs> before we come into it. So, you know, educating yourself on, on how to do it and, and taking those steps. Um, one way I think one thing I would say uh, two things in response to your question. One, it starts with the advisor, um, and it starts with the advisor setting clear expectations. Um, so I'll pick on Stephen just because he's here. He's here when he came, expressed interest in working with me. Um, he finally 
accepted and uh, was admitted and started on campus, arrived on campus. Well, even prior to, you know, I made sure that he met with some of my grad students. And then when he came here, you know, I wanted to make sure that he, that I connected him to all of that group, if you will. And they kind of did some of the heavy lifting because he, the way I looked at it, that I had developed, created a culture in his lab. We were all on the same page. And it was easier for his peers to say, hey, this is how we do things. And in a very short, very little time, he kind of understood that this is what he was buying into and that everyone was on the same page. And so um, all those individuals saw that picture. We were, I mean, we, they did phenomenal work. I mean, I tell folks all the time that, yeah, I may be the advisor, but um, a lot of ideas that drove change we did at MAP were driven by those students. They weren't driven by me. And I'm okay with that. When you hire excellent people, that's how it should be, right? Leaders should lead and, and bring people together. But for me, it started me setting expectations. And um, and then as you bring new students in, Stephen and others, introducing Stephen and others to these to those in my grad, my grad group, and they kind of, you know, said, this is how we operate this lab. This is Dr. S. He's, you know, you're going to meet with him. He's going to expect this. If you do X, he's going to say that. So, and it was it's how we operate. And it worked, it's worked out well. Um, I think Steve would echo the same thing. It's, it's worked out well, actually. One thing I've noticed in our group is that um, I believe that most of in our group feel like well involved in running of the group. Because when you join our group, my professor has this uh, practice where he assigns you something to do. And this is probably a lot of groups do this as well. For example, it could be like in charge of purchasing stuff or doing this. And what you slowly start to see is that everyone feels that they're part of running the group because if it comes Monday and you don't do purchase, people are gonna be like, hey, why haven't you done this stuff, right? And once you start doing that, everyone actually feels that, okay, hey, I'm playing a huge part in this group. But if you have a scenario where maybe some people just don't you know, play an active part and maybe run in the group or they don't really like, they're the shy that they don't really speak up. You start having situations where, you know, things show up, issues show up, but people are not speaking up, right? And that practice I've also seen my professor do is that um, at the start of group meetings, so the agenda is always going to be, it's always, okay, the lab ma I'm the lab manager now, so the lab manager, you know, do you have any announcements? Then the safety officer, then open discussion. I have an open discussion. My professor just says, oh, is there any open discussion item? And he waits for like a good minute, even if no one wants mm -hmm. to say anything. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you start seeing maybe some people wait to like the 59 second and they're like, oh, there's this stuff that showed up. Right? <laughs> and the, the whole idea of that is that he's trying to encourage people to kind of speak up more. You know, I'm a member of a large group. They are about, currently now with the new students, we have about 17 PhD students. So it's pretty, it's like a, a, a large group. So it's, it's important that people feel that they can really like speak up when they want to. Before uh, the other two remaining panelists uh, jump in, I do want to add something. I don't do this, but I, I have heard folks at college other institutions do this. <clears throat> so whereas I set the expectations verbally and just, just how the culture has been developed and created, others have created lab manuals where they may have principles of values and expectations written down. Teach his own, right? I'm not saying one is better than the other. This works for me. It's worked for 14 years and I'm going to continue to do it. But others do, and I'm not saying, I don't think the lab man should be too too prescriptive. I think they don't do that, but I do think if that could work for you, then that may be a viable strategy for you to have a lab man. We talk about these are the values. This is what we value in this lab, right? The Smith lab. This is what, these are our principles. This is, you know, these are the expectations. So I do think that's something I would make sure I would add that too. You go. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I guess I just kind of hear everything that has been, been said. Um, I have, I've done both. So I have a lamb manual um, that I started kind of in the beginning. Um, and then, but once the culture has been built, I actually just kind of found it buried in a folder a couple of months ago. And I said, no, I should bring this back out. I should update this, you know? So like, it, it, it's ever evolving. I I I try different things um, with my group. You know, whether it be the structure of our our lab meetings or or, or the way the the work is divided among the group. But I always do it in consultation with them. 
um, I do have a research scientist that works with me and, and helps, you know, and so a lot of the making sure that, but it's still a fairly flat organization. So the, the, the lines of communication are open. I mean, we keep that. I feel like I'm repeating that every other week. Come talk to me. Um, so just, again, I guess it's mirroring a lot of what we've said already in terms of setting the behavior and setting that culture. Those are really important ways to think about the way we run our business. First, I'm very impressed you found something in a folder. But then second, I'll just get a little bit more granular, um, which is that the most important product of anybody's lab, I would argue, and I would, maybe my panelists would agree or not, um, is actually the graduate, the people who come through the lab. Far more important than anything else that we do, that we generate, that we create. Um, and so these environments and this inclusive, these inclusive communities that you're hearing about and the different ways people are executing, moving those inclusive communities forward, I think founding that in this idea that this whole thing exists so that you members of the community are successful, so that you go from where you were when you got here to where you are when you graduate and are ready to go forward with your PhD to lead a research group at a national lab somewhere, or where you're going to go with your bachelor's degree when you're going to go out to the most profitable company in the history of civilization and be a leader and drive the things forward, right? Or you're going to go out to an international experience here, there, or wherever. The idea that it's all about making these members of the community successful. Make, I think that that helps all of the activities that we pursue to create that inclusive environment. Everybody can buy into my own success. Everybody understands, well, that's a good thing to be working towards, and I understand why I'm doing that. So I always... I, I do some of what has been mentioned, but all we grounded in this idea that this is how you're going to be successful when you leave. And I, I find that that makes it easy for people to buy it. Can I can I just say something? Based, I love the way you framed the, the the most important product of our research labs of this university is people that we are training, putting out there. And I, again, I come back to this kind of putting our putting some oomph behind, you know, what we say we value. Um, you know, we're all asked as faculty members to put down in our PNG documents, like, what are your research products? Um, well, my research products are my graduate students and how successful they're doing when they train and things like that. And so, you know, finding ways to really center that idea and push it forward and distribute that ethos throughout the, the community, your, your lab, your department, the, the university. I love, you know, talking as, um, Talking more about how we can do that as a community. Someone you would want to raise your hand. I think I saw you. I came from my. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have a question. Well, we're slightly interrupted. I wanted to ask y'all before we run out of time. I have a case study for you, and I'm the case study. <laughs> so um, I come from a corporate culture. I'm working part time here at Purdue as a career counselor, helping students get jobs. So I might see 150 students in a semester. Maybe 10% of those really dive into the long-term mentoring relationship. You know, some have known for four years. Some have visited me at home in Texas. But for the ones that just come through your office for like 45 minutes, how can you create the things you said, LaVon, about the equity, sense of belonging, sense of care, you know, in that brief time that you have. Little nuggets, right? Just little pieces of connection. I just had a student in my office uh, a couple of days ago and I was searching for an email that she had sent me and someone, somebody else's email popped up and she said, oh, do you know this person? And then, you know, and oh, it was this biochemistry training program that she did in high school. And yeah, I was involved in that. And just, and that just, I love that interaction because it just, it, connected us in a way that was know, just very, it, like it, it meant a lot to me um, mm -hmm. and broke down that student teacher hierarchy for, you know, just a few minutes. But I, so these little nuggets of, of interaction we can do. Okay. Mm -hmm. One thing I would add is, so you mentioned 45 minutes of the day. So a couple weeks ago I spoke, uh, it was a virtual talk at the game for the postdoc association conference. Um, that was based, that was uh, being, coordinated between Northwestern and the University of Chicago and um, UIC, maybe, maybe. 
And anyhow, so I gave a talk, and then every time I give a talk, I always put my LinkedIn and my Twitter and my email in the chat. I say, listen, if you all need some advice after the day, just reach out, you know? So this woman reached out and we scheduled a conversation. I met with her Wednesday this week, and she's a postdoc, and she's looking for a fellowship or, or a faculty position. And it was only a 30-minute call, but... In the 30 minute call, you know, she expressed to me what her needs were, and I listened and I said, Okay, here's some advice. Here's what I help you do. And she said, I said, before we left the call, I said, Anything, anything else? She said, Dr. Esther, I just can't believe that you're doing this for me. <laughs> she says, I just, I never, I didn't expect to get this in this 30 minutes. And so it can actually happen in less than 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so, but my point is this notion of, expressed care and concern and wanting to help her yeah. and gave her some advice. And I said, I would work in these ways. I would use some of my connections, my network to help her mm -hmm. to position her for an upper trajectory or continued upper trajectory. And that, that's what happened. And that actually happened again previous week with a gentleman who was here in the College of Ed who's uh, uh, put in touch with me from a, one of my colleagues here. Again, yeah, another 30 minute call. So. It can happen, but I think what students are looking for is, you know, do you are you really genuinely, authentically concerned about them being successful? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think this gentleman, this woman, and, and this gentleman um, were in this room. They would say, yeah, in thirty minutes, he made it happen. So that's how I responded to your question. Mm -hmm. And thank you, to Dr. A's point, um, as one of his students on that end of it. Yeah, and one of the reasons I invited to be on this panel is like I know firsthand what this looks like. Dr. E knows the limits of his expertise and knows through his network who would be better. And he'll constantly not waste your time just be like, hey, this is great. Let's talk through your end of it. But let me go ahead and start okay. an email and he introduce you to this other person. And I, I can't say how many times We've done that, making connections with people I would have never known from at the conference that he was on a research project with a million years ago. Um, <laughs> you didn't look at all. I don't think he was. But it, it's true. He, we know we have a short amount of time that we can meet with him regularly, but he maximizes that in real time by doing the things that he mentioned earlier. But also, a lot of my growth and development has come by him being the orchestrator of me finding growth and development from others. Um, and so people that he knows are an expert in the field that I want to research with, put me in contact with them, give them a little bit of background on me, and then let us take that conversation from there. As he mentioned, you know, I, we had a, a large group when I started of students, and he's like, you know, you're, you're going to learn the most about how to be successful early on by talking with them. And, and it's so true. You know, we, we have much more time as students to be able to converse with one another and learn from one another. Like, hey, he's, he's asked me to turn, I mean, he wants on a regular basis, like our updated CVs and resumes. And like, if you come in and yours is not to the, the par of what everybody else's is, you're going to waste a lot more time emailing him back and forth like, hey, does this look better? Does that look better? But you're going to save a lot of time by talking to the others in the grad group and letting them say, no, he's going to hate that right there. You got to do that right now. Um, unless you want to look crazy when you get that meeting, but that's up to you. But <laughs> truly, my my growth and the, the rest of my, my fellow students in, in our group, we grow better through those relationships with one another, knowing that we can maximize our time with them, that he knows on the reciprocal, that he's not going to waste our time when he knows that there's somebody else that would do such a better job mm -hmm. in connecting with us. And even his former students, I've had so many conversations with students that I was never here with, that we talk with, um, that can help me with my research, that can help me with kind of designing different things that, that I needed help with. For like, look, you know, Brandon did this recently. Talk to him, meet with him, and you know, Brandon and I were not even here at the same time. So, just things like that, I think, are also good. You don't have to be overwhelmed as a mentor with how I mentor this student if I don't have everything that they need. Um, and so, I think Dr. E does a good job of that as well. Remember that, Dr. E. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So for the sake of time, I'm going to ask one last question, which was highly requested from the group fellows. So research demonstrates 
that sometimes faculty members can misinterpret the call to diversity sensitivity as a call to lower their standards. To clarify this misconception, what does becoming sensitive to diversity actually mean? So lowering their standards, I mean like lowering their expectations of their graduate students, their students in classrooms, things like that. Yeah, it doesn't mean that at all. It means meeting people where they are. Uh, to me, um, everyone comes in with the diversity of experiences and mindset and and our jobs are to train them to be the best versions of themselves and to guide them on that path to finding out where they want to be and where they want to go. And so it just means being open and caring and 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 recognizing that you can provide the guidance and the leadership for them to to get to where they need to go, um, no matter wherever they're starting from. But your goal is that they be the best version of themselves and to be successful and help them to find that success for themselves and guide them on the path to that. That's what it means to me. Tammy, let me be. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm, I'm well, I'll, I'll go. Um, I think that that's actually uh, a rather cynical and um, easy way to get out of responding to the real question, right? which which is, oh yeah, you're asking me to lower my expectations. That's the cynical, easy way out. The fact of the matter is, there's value associated with being a boilermaker, having boilermaker attached to you. And as you said, meeting people where they are. But there's an expectation of what a boilermaker can do when they bench. And everybody is going to be able to do that. And, and our job is to help people. And that means helping individuals get to that point where they can go out and deliver as everyone expects a boilermaker to be able to deliver. Helping somebody to go fail is not helping somebody. Right? And we have to meet people where they are, engage them as they are, get them to the point where they can go out and be technically excellent, um, culturally excellent. And be excellent, we be what is needed to be a success objectively in their discipline. And the key to it, when you mentioned diversity and inclusion, is recognizing not everybody starts at the same place. Not very, everybody approaches it from the same perspective. Nobody comes into it with the same diversity of background, right? the same set of experiences. That doesn't mean that everybody can't you know, pull the same ring. Right? We've got to help them by whatever path is necessary to be able to pull that rank. Okay, that's the real answer, not, oh, you're just asking me to, to set the bar lower. That's not it at all. It's that we're going to have lots of different ways to get over the bar. We've got to work with people by many pathways, not just the pathway we follow. It's very easy for everybody to just say, everyone's going to do it the same way I did it, which is not the right way to go. I think I got kind of intense there. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Like that, 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 that mindset I disagree with strongly. Oh, so for me, as like an aspir aspiring faculty, I actually see the call to diversity as actually improving your standards. And the reason why I say so is because of we're moving towards a world where you know, someone can fly from like one end of the world to the other end, of, like less than like you know, a day, right? And you know, you can quickly call anyone at any time, you can pass through the world. And, but you start understanding how it's important to just, you know, not just build teams that, you know, where people just share the same educational background or the same identity or everything, like build teams that actually capture sort of that, you know, that breadth of the world. And I think that's kind of where the standard should be. So like, it's actually be more of a good that we wear, like think about it more of like, you're actually now improving your standard by like, Consciously trying to like build teams where you understand that everyone has you know, different things to bring, and it also you know, it also ensures that you don't you know, you're always aware of what's happening, right? We've heard like you know horror stories from companies that make a product, and then all then they just realize that hey, you know they equally they had someone from a different team, the person that put in they're like oh this wouldn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So you hear stories like that. So I think it's um you know, that's my own take on it. I mean, thing I would add is. You mentioned, uh, Steve, excellence, the word excellent, three times in your response. <laughs> uh, many of you probably have heard this notion of inclusive excellence. 
So I'm just saying that we're inclusive point to attention to in the beginning of that. Um, and for those of you who may not, whether you're in the room or online, <coughs> you know, the really inclusive uh, National Academy of Sciences came up with a STEM mentoring report. You can just Google it, STEM mentoring report, STE and two M's. It talks about um, within that, that report, um, inclusive excellence, you know, they define and so on and so forth, and the importance of it in the work that we do as faculty members on the academy. So, um, again, I just think everything that's been said, but I think, you know, just again to add on what Steve mentioned, this question of inclusive excellence is, um, is a cousin to and, is, and fully embraces this notion of diversity and inclusion. So, thank you. So, with that, <clears throat> I wrap the end of my questions, but I'll open it up to our audience online in person. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, I have one more on my hand. Is it under questions or is it comments? Whatever you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I can go first. Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for this panel. My name is Mike uh, Serenjic. I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Ag and Bio Engineering. Um, so I'll share a bit of my experience, and I think uh, it's alluding to uh, what the panelists talk, talked about some time back. Um, my experience when I moved into the US, um, I think um, I had, a, I would say I had a soft landing because of the way um, I found my research group, the diverse which was in the group. <clears throat> but also my professors um, made that environment conducive for me. Um, I usually ask my friends that um, have you ever, if, if you have never gone on uh, on lunch with your professor, or you have never, they, you have never been invited to your professor's house, then you should check your relationship with them, mm -hmm. because as international students, when we, when we move in here, um, usually we don't have our family, so our bosses, our professors, become like our immediate family members, whom we report to everything. Uh, the, the tendency of, uh, I mean, it's, I think it depends on the where you grew up from. You see your boss as uh, there's a curtain between you and your boss. So when you move here and the professors don't take that curtain away, um, you are kind of, you know, creating that bridge between you and the student. And at the end of the day, um, it's, it's not about the research you are doing, it's about the relationship with your professor, because that's what I was taught. That once you establish a relationship with your professor, is more important than even the research you are doing. We have seen students who have um, good, I'll say, research funding from NSF, from NASA, but they hate grad school because they don't have that relationship with the professor. And then some students who don't even have like a strong research topic, but they're enjoying grad school because <laughs> their, their professors have built that relationship with them, right? Um, that is something one of my professors told me before I even come, I came to America. He told me it is very important to have a relationship with your professor. And it's something I've carried in along the way. I'm lucky that my professors, uh, when I was in Iowa State and here at Purdue, they have been like friends and colleagues. And as a student, um, you reach a point whereby you want to work even extra because you want to pay the friend. It's no longer like, your superior, I mean, it's your superior, but not like your boss. But you don't even, there's, there isn't that fear, it's more like a friend or the colleague. So you could even go in the lab 3 a.m. and work because you, want, you don't want to find a friend. Um, so uh, it's something I wanted to point out that it is very important for building those relationships. And I'm glad you, you guys talked about that as well. Um, another thing is um, when students move in here, uh, to diversify the teams in classes when they're forming teams. Um, I found a challenge whereby when we were asked to form teams, um, it was hard for me to form teams because I wasn't from here. And then pretty much maybe some students came in with, uh, they know their friends. So it was easy to form teams for classwork. And it wasn't di diversifying teams um, until when we discussed it with um, uh, the, 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 the professor, the guests I was taking, and then the professor started forming teams. So once professors form teams in the classes, um, you don't have an option of saying, I don't want this, uh, this person on my team. So that is another way of uh, <clears throat> diversifying the, the teams within the, the classes as well. Um, so I think to, for me, um, one thing that I mentioned last, 
as well, a friend mentioned to me that whoever doesn't embrace diversity and inclusion, their idea is they consider in a box. That's what my friend told me. And uh, I would encourage you to look at that picture before you go. The stage in six. Inclusion and diversity in poor scientific breakthrough. There are so many pictures, but I pointed out that one, uh, particularly for uh, this discussion. But, yeah, thank you so much. Wow, okay. Yes. Yeah. So happy that I can I guess your question about how to, uh, your perspective about humanitarian post-op. I'm not sure if you're a fan of this. I'm not sure if you're a fan of this. I'm not sure if you're a fan of this. So for, I, I started my post-ops two months before I came to this study. Then um, I'm very lucky to have a really great humanitarian um, supervisor. But during the last um, two and a half years, I, uh, I have felt really good. Um, so I'm with this one, and then it's really hard for me to like a mentoring a graduate student, a hundred graduate students, and asking a mentoring for my supervisor. So I'm sometimes because I'm in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I'm not a graduate student, I'm not a faculty. I'm just, I'm just curious about how mm -hmm. you, um, your perspective of mentoring your uh, post. So, so and really quickly for our audience online, um, the question was, how can we improve mentoring for postdocs as well as approach issues to our advisors when there are issues in the mentorship relationship? I'm referring to you because the postdoc is a lot more common engineering than having good education. So, yeah. I well, I, I'll speak a little bit from my experience, both as a postdoc myself and as a PI. <laughs> Um, you know, graduate students come in as a cohort, yeah. and that in, in a lot of ways, you know, the department departments build up uh, ways to in which to 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 build that sense of community. Postdocs come in and they come in, you know, kind of all at the same time. Postdocs come in whenever and leave whenever, and it is very isolating already. And then you throw the pandemic on top of it. I can't even imagine. So I, you know, kudos for you for for being here and seeking out that that help and, and that advice. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is, you know, you ask, how do you ask for mentoring? And the first step is to ask, right? I mean, I think, and the first step is, is talking with, finding a cohort, uh, um, building a network of mentors and building a network of peers. Um, so we've been talking a lot about in, in our department about how do we, how do we provide graduate students and postdocs with more broad-based mentoring? And how do we structure our program in such a way that we do that? Because we, we saw coming out of the pandemic that everyone felt so isolated. And we went two years, you know, students went two years without meeting anyone except for their advisor you know, every other week or once a month or even weekly, but it's, it was very isolating and siloed. Um, and so as a department, we're, we're looking at how do we structure things so that we can have that more broad-based mentoring and students don't have to be as proactive that they that we're building that structure for them. Um, similarly for postdocs, biomedical engineering has one of the largest cohorts of you know on a per capita basis of, of postdocs. We have over 25 postdocs in the department. How do we build a community for them? Um, and in some ways it's just about empowering them to to build that community for themselves and giving them a little bit of resources and offering some suggestions and then letting it self-organize and, and the, the postdocs coming together. I just presented a time management talk to the, to the group uh, earlier in the week. Um, so, you know, there are just a few ideas um, about how you can ask for more mentoring, ask your department for some resources to, to start to form a group or ask someone that, Maybe you don't have to do it, but ask if someone can. Um, and then to build a, a mentoring or a, a peer to peer network. Um, uh, what was the other point that I made? Um, yeah, and it's it is kind of just taking that, breaking down those barriers to to and take the initiative and you've already taken the first step. Let me know, and we can talk separately. I'm, I'm happy to kind of share. Okay, so. Let me take a little different look at this. Um, 
in terms of understanding where the problem starts. Uh, and I think it's absolutely true that of all of the members of the community with whom the faculty might interact and would we expect to work as mentors, postdocs probably get the shortest end of the stake. Um, and I believe that is because of our expectation of what a postdoc brings. I think we frequently look at postdocs as finished products who can come in and get that job right there done for us that we need done because we just hit this grant and it's off cycle and we don't have a graduate student to put on there and it's really more of a contract than a grant. We don't have time for graduate student to learn and come up to speed because graduate student isn't ready to go until they've been through a year of classes and then six months figuring out what's in the lab. But here you are and you already know how to do all of these things. So get in there and get to work. <laughs> That's not the basis of a strong mentoring relationship. It certainly meets the needs of the faculty to get some technical results generated, uh, but it does not meet the, <laughs> the needs of you as uh, grow as a colleague who's evolving towards, in most cases, a faculty position. So my suggestion would be to sort of break that paradigm, and when you are negotiating with the person who's going to be your mentor when you come in as a postdoc, to have the discussion explicitly, this is what I'm hoping to get out of this. Most postdocs are coming in because they got their PhD and they focused in this area here, and they've got to go a little bit that way so that when they put together their, their portfolio for their faculty positions, they're more diverse than just competing with their old advisor. Right? They've got, they can do that, but then they can do these things, and that allows them to be someday internationally recognized as a leading scholar in their field. Right? But if you come into that relationship and say, okay, I'm going to do that, right? and don't worry, I'll get you your five papers in two, and a half, in two years, uh, but I also am hoping that you will be my mentor in these different ways. If you can have that explicit discussion, I think that will help you to set expectations on both sides. It might eliminate some, some opportunities from people who really just want someone to get in there and be quiet and get things done. But that probably wasn't going to be the best opportunity for you to begin with. But if you can help to set the expectation up front that I don't just want an opportunity to work, I want an opportunity to be mentored in the following ways, I think that that can help to have the relationship be more productive. If you just leave it up to the faculty member to plug a hole that's needed in their portfolio to get some research results generated, I think commonly that is what will happen. Maybe not the most. And if you're not finding it from your immediate research mentor, then go find other mentors. Yeah, that idea that there's a community of mentors is a very good idea. I, I still have mentors. In fact, I'm going to a meeting next week in Phoenix and I'm going to see the person who was my mentor when I first became a faculty. And I'm more excited about that than anything that's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to get to see him and talk, to him and he still mentors me now. And I left that university where he was mentoring me in 2002. And he still guides me. And he's certainly not here, and I don't encounter him every day, but he still guides me. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm not saying that my advisor no. is a medical mentor, but there are no, people that are listening and it's relevant. Mentoring, but um, emotionally and mentally, I, I felt it's not because of my supervisor. And my supervisor really care about not just me and my family and everything. But I, as a postdoc, I have kind of, I felt that uh, I'm also, I need to still mentoring. Um, and also give a mentor, provide a mentor, uh, mentoring, uh, uh, provide a uh, mentee uh, with mentor, mentor. Yeah. So I just felt that as a postdoc, I just wanted to develop more of those things. Well, I think, I think again, uh, I echo everything that's been said. This community is approaching it through this lens of this, of this approach of a, of a community, building a community, right? I think peers. Uh, postdocs, right? Those are your peers, and that's one way. And uh, our network of mentor, um, I think those two ways can address some of your concerns. Um, I think without a doubt, it would, it would do that. So I think to pursue that would be my advice as well. Yeah. Well, with that, I will conclude our seminar today. We want to thank our panelists for the awesome conversation we had today. Um, so we can give them a round of applause. Um, so we have a couple of announcements for our audience. Uh, we do have a survey 
Um, so to fill out, please, that'd be great to just let us know whether the seminar was helpful. Do you want to have more seminars like this in the future? Um, that'd be great. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Emily. And again, thank you, panelists, for sharing your very valuable time, expertise, strategies. I think uh, comments online. We had, we had a nice turnout online, too, about a dozen people. So a lot of people benefited from this this morning, and we thank you. Um, kudos to the uh, grad student mentoring organization and uh, the Sears. Okay, right. And we have get no small piece, and that's a grassroots effort for you. So, thank you so much. I have a dedicated job to doing this, and it, it's hard for me to do, so I can't even imagine. So, my next thing would be to plug the next faculty workshop, which will be December 6th. Very different topic, but an also very interesting one for faculty. It's about you. It's called Amplifying Your Research, and it's about using social media to uh, to get your your work out there. So we'll have some faculty that are really good at that. We'll have some folks from the university news net, news services as well as the uh, college too. So you can understand what resources are available there. So thank you. Thank you.